Uh, Audrey and her husband, Andrew, transferred here from the Rio Brazos chapter. They graduated in 2020. And so now they're members of our chapter. And you'll see that our next uh, member in training is Peregrine on his dad's lap. And then um, Gerald Garrett was in last year's class, tw class of 2022. So take it away. Good evening, everyone. Um, so Audrey and I are going to be presenting some uh, portions of our uh, thesis research for you tonight. Um, <clears throat> we thought it would be a good idea for us to present uh, together, uh, just so that you guys could have a uh, kind of a kind of get the full picture of everything that's going on with uh, these restored thorn forest habitats um, with both the plants and the animals. All right, so. As usual, we'll start with a bit of background information and now bear with me here. This may be a bit unnecessary for this group or a bit redundant. Um, but Tamalipa Thorn Forest is the critical native habitat in the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, and it extends about 240 miles along the Texas-Mexico border, ending at the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, it is considered a transition area from tropical to temperate climates. And it is considered a conservation hotspot due to the high level of diversity maintained in the area, as well as a, a high risk for human degradation. Uh, but it does generate about $300 million in re revenue annually for the region in ecotourism. Now, regarding biodiversity in the area, uh, Thorn scrub is a uh, habitat for about 1,200 plant species, uh, 300 butterfly species, and 700 vertebrates, uh, which includes about 520 species of birds. Um, soils here are usually consist, uh, have, a, have a large percentage of clay within them, and that's just due to our situation on the Rio Grande River Delta. Uh, vegetation structure is highly variable, either shrublands or woodlands. Uh, where canopy cover varies depending on the component species as well as moisture availability. Understory is usually dense. Um, it can be up to uh, three meters in height, sometimes taller. And uh, ground uh, layer vegetation is usually sparse in undisturbed forests. And now, um, thorn forests as, and forests in general are important because of the ecosystem services that they provide. And a few Key ecosystem services related to biodiversity include pollinator services, pest and disease control, as well as increased resilience to disturbance and environmental changes. And a loss of biodiversity in an area uh, results in a reduction of ecosystem services. And here we have, right? We have pictured here on the, um, on the right, a uh, local example of that, where we have seen uh, Decreases in the Manfreda giant skipper um, due to land use changes and decreases in their host plant, the Texas tuberose. Um, here locally, threats against biodiversity include habitat loss and degradation, which historically was uh, caused by agriculture, but more recently due to urban expansion. And also invasive species are a particular concern in the area because they uh, outcompete our native species for resources like uh, nutrients, light, water, and even physical space. And then with regards to invasive grasses, they often um, reduce woody species recruitment. Um, so all of that land clearing has left only about 10% of Tamalipa and Thorn Forest in its native state. But there have been uh, a lot of restor restoration efforts in the uh, lower Rio Grande Valley uh, that have been conducted over the past 70 years. Um, mostly by federal and state uh, entities, but uh, some NGOs and corporate entities have been have contributed as well, such as like as the Nature Conservancy and the Land Life Company. An estimated 16,000 acres of uh, thorn forest has been restored in the area, mostly by Texas Parks and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, and that includes both passive and active restoration. Passive restoration meaning that the area is protected and natural succession is allowed to take place to recover the habitat and active active uh, restoration refers to um, 
like land management and going in and actually seeding or transplanting seedlings to aid in the recovery of that habitat. So a ton of work has gone into restoration in the area, but have their efforts been successful? And it's actually a really difficult question to, to answer because there's no consensus in the scientific community of like how to measure success in restoration outcomes. Um, lots of different principles and conceptual frameworks have been put forth, but usually practitioners me measure diversity, vegetation structure, and ecological processes. And a lot of times the animals aren't surveyed when, um, when trying to understand restoration outcomes. Um, some argue the, some argue if you build it, they will come. They're saying if you put the right plants there, then the right animals are going to show up and you don't need to survey them. But others say you can't just make assumptions like that. You need to survey both in order to understand the outcomes of your restoration efforts. So in the valley here, a lot of studies have actually been conducted to uh, the aim to evaluate restoration outcomes, but they've almost always focused on just woody plant species. So what we wanted to do is look at plants and animals in um, several different plots around the valley to see how they've returned and what relationships they have to different environmental and site characteristics. Um, so we wanted to investigate relationships between restoration outcomes and key site characteristics and environmental factors. And we chose these based on, in the literature, what shows up as important. Um, so our focal site characteristics were the time since the restoration began, patch size, degree of isolation, and restoration method. And then we chose about 23 other environmental factors that we measured at each of our sites. And the kind of categories were the plant community structure, climate, distance to water sources, and invasive species prevalence. Uh, so these are the 12 sites that we selected around the valley. You see a lot of them are concentrated around the border, but we also had a, a few in the north. And six of these were um, are managed by the Texas Parks and Wildlife, and five by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and then one, Duckhead, is managed by the university. And when we selected our sites, we aimed for variation in those four site characteristics. We wanted some large, old, passively restored sites and some small, young, actively restored sites because the more variety we had, the better we can statistically isolate which of those factors are influencing the communities. So our two objectives were one, to characterize and quantify plant and animal communities of multiple taxa in restored uh, thorn scrub forest habitats in South Texas, and two, to examine the relationships between restored plant and animal communities and key site characteristics and environmental factors with the hope that if we understand what is influencing those communities, we can use that information in restoration efforts going forward. Okay, so how did we go about collecting all of this uh, vegetation data for our assessment? So we surveyed the sites once in 2022 and it was hot all the time. Um, <laughs> And when we, so we established six vegetation sampling points in each of our sites for a total of 72 vegetation sampling points. And when establishing a point, we would first uh, identify a central point where we would insert a soil probe into the ground and get measurements for soil moisture and soil temperature, as well as take a canopy photo uh, for evaluation of canopy, canopy cover later on. Canopy vegetation was assessed using the point quarter method. Um, which is denoted by the uh, blue arrows in the diagram. And what that involves is uh, identifying the closest tree in each quadrant to the central point, and then we would identify its species, uh, measure the distance from the tree to the central point, measure its diameter at breadth height, breadth, breast height and then um, also its height. Understory vegetation was uh, was assessed by using the, uh, estimating the percent occupancy uh, by species in a 10 square meter uh, sampling area. So we would actually encircle the, uh, our central point, the, the black dot there, uh, with a circle that had a radius of 1.8 meters, which equals about 10 square meters. It's actually a little bit over, but that was how we uh, assessed understory vegetation. Uh, ground layer vegetation, we use the quadrat method where we would place a one meter quadrat, one square meter quadrat 
in each quadrant, and we would, um, along the perimeter of our understory vegetation sampling area, and then we would estimate the percent occupancy by species uh, for the ground fairs. Uh, GIS software, ArcMap, was used to extract uh, environmental uh, factors and geographic features uh, from raster and vector data sets, and we were able to get values for long-term temperature and precipitation from the PRISM climate group. Uh, elevation was retrieved from the uh, USGS National Map Downloader webpage. Um, and then after we uploaded the elevation data set into ArcMap, we, ArcMap, we were able to construct a slope map for the region. Distances, distances to temporary and permanent water sources were retrieved from the National Wetlands Inventory data set. Um, and we were able to further re refine that data set into temporary and permanent water sources based on attributes um, that each water source had that was displayed in the attribute table. Soil type was uh, obtained from the USDA Web Soil Survey website. And after we uh, were, after we obtained the soil type for our survey points, we would have to cross-reference that back to um, the actual website to get the percentage of sand content for the first for the first 60 centimeters of uh, of soil we use that kind of as a drainage representation and all of our statistical analysis and hypothesis testing was conducted in R um, so now that we've collected our data and analyzed it let's take a look at some of the results so we uh, observed a total of 72 plant species contributing contributing to thorn forest uh, vegetation, nine of which were invasive. And if we take a look at the average abundance by, by site, we can see that Duckhead, the one that was managed by the university, actually had the highest abundance of all of the sites. And Goat Island, which I believe was the oldest site, had the least abundance of all of the, all of the sites. Looking at the average abundance by species, we can see the first species there was over four times more abundant than any other species in any other canopy layer that we looked at. That species there is Eurocloa maxima, which is commonly known as guinea grass, an invasive species. So, yeah, that, that, that sucked. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> okay, we then conducted a principal component analysis um, to see contributions of individual factors. Um, to, to dimensions, and uh, we can see looking at all of the dimensions, I don't think this pointer is working. Um, okay, but we can see that the first three dimensions um, account for 51.5% of the total variance. Um, and then also principal component analysis is good for making sense of a lot of factors, and we had, as Audrey mentioned, a lot of factors that we considered. Um, so our first principal component dimension uh, kind of had like a uh, vegetation complexity type theme consisting of total richness, invasive grasses, and total diversity. Our dimension two had kind of like a, a site characteristic theme with uh, con contributions from long-term precipitation, patch size, and interior to, inter interior to edge ratio. And then uh, dimension three had kind of like a biogeography type theme with contributions coming from elevation, long-term temperature, and isolation. We then over, uh, plotted our first two principal component dimensions and overlaid our study sites to see how um, factors uh, influenced our study sites. And we can see that our study sites are form two distinct groups, one passive and one active. They do have a little bit of overlap there, but not much. Um, and a little note here on these uh, arrows, the environmental vectors, if they are close together and going in the same direction, they share a relationship. If they go the opposite direction, their relationship is inversely related. So we can see a grouping of factors here on the upper right with, that include patch size, interior to edge ratio, and restoration time um, that are all associated or related to the passively restored sites. And we kind of knew this going in. Um, and that just has to do with the restoration history of the Rio Grande Valley. Um, all of the older restored sites were larger and passively restored. But what relationship we did not expect was for those three site factors, the patch size, interior to edge ratio, and restoration time, 
to have an inverse relationship with long term precipitation and for long term precipitation to be related to our actively restored sites. And we really don't know why that is. We don't know why our newly restored smaller sites are wetter. Um, another interesting relationship that we can see here, though, is the inverse relationship in the upper left of invasive grasses uh, and our total richness and total diversity. We then conducted an NMDS ordination uh, to see how our environmental factors uh, related to our study sites. And then we did an environmental fit to see how those, uh, I'm sorry, to identify, we did the NMDS ordination to identify influential species at our study sites. And then we did the environmental fit to overlay our environmental, our environmental factors and see how they're related to our uh, study sites. And this, is, this ordination plot demonstrates a pretty powerful trend. Quick note, the survey points are, are the little circles there and, cir and points that are closer together are more similar in their composition. We can see a large clustering of sites here on the left with many other sites uh, around the perimeter that display a good spread. Well, that large clustering of sites is located with guinea grass. So we can infer from this that the point spread is being driven by the presence of guinea grass. And those sites that are associated with guinea grass are more homogeneous and similar. And those sites that are located around the perimeter are different. Now, this isn't something new. The ecological concept of an invasive species causing homogeneity within an environment, that's, just, that's a pretty common thing. But this is the first time this has been documented concerning a particular species in restored thorn forest habitats. So that was pretty cool. Not that they're homogenous, but that we saw that. <laughs> All right. Um, so now concerning the, uh, we also did a, a bunch of univariate analysis to see how our, our site characteristics and, and environmental factors uh, affected uh, community composition. And so regarding uh, method of restoration, we can see that it influenced uh, thorn forest richness, abundance, and diversity. But what's cool about this is that active, re actively restored sites had higher averages than all uh, in all of our metrics over the passively restored sites. And when I saw that, I was like, good news, right? That means all of the land management that's been done to restore these sites is actually working. So that was cool. Um, regarding time since restoration, um, it had a positive influence on richness and diversity. Um, we kind of expected this just because longer time periods are associated with increases in diversity. Um, but what we can see here, remember in the uh, principal component plot, we saw those factors that were clustered together and related. This demonstrates that really nice. All of our actively restored sites, which are the ones in red, are located on the left and associated with shorter time periods. And they're also smaller. And um, the passively restored sites are all on the, the right associated with longer time periods. Degree of isolation had a uh, positive influence on all three of our uh, composition metrics. This was an unexpected uh, relationship because it kind of contradicts the idea that isolated areas are usually less diverse. Um, and we're not really sure why that is. We kind of have an idea and we think it has something to do with the metric that we used. And a quick note on that, our degree of isolation metric was not an absolute distance to the nearest patch. Patch size did not influence thorn forest vegetation uh, composition, but this factor was often removed uh, from our statist statistical models due to multicollinearity with time since restoration and restoration method. But of those three factors, patch size often explained the least amount of variance. That's so we would take it out when we were uh, doing model pruning. Uh, regard regarding um, exotic vegetation, our native to exotic ratio influenced uh, our three composition metrics positively. Um, and this, so a little note on the ratio here. So more natives would equal a higher value and uh, more exotics would equal a lower value. So 
more natives equals more diversity. And our invasive grass cover here, again, as we've seen many times already, had a negative influence on thorn forest diversity. Our site environmental factors kind of had uh, varying effects on different um, composition metrics. Uh, but what was interesting to me here is that our long-term precipitation and long-term uh, temperature didn't influence composition at all. Um, and I couldn't understand temperature because when, when we got those values, there was only a difference of 0.2 degrees between all of our sites. So I didn't really think that that would matter that much. But long-term precipitation had a range of about 120 millimeters from the highest to the lowest site. So I was kind of thinking that that might uh, influence a bit, but statistically it did not. Uh, again, ge geographic factors um, kind of had uh, varying effects on um, our composition metrics, uh, but soil temperature, soil moisture, and our hog disturbance did not influence any corn forest composition. So what conclusions can we derive from these analyses? First and foremost, invasive grasses strongly influence restored thorn forest plant community structure, homogenizing habitats, and reducing diversity. Restoration method was important, and our results demonstrate that active restoration has influenced community composition and increased richness, abundance, and diversity. Richness and diversity increase with time since restoration, and greater distances from tempor temporary water reduced richness and diversity. Uh, future directions, we would like to collect additional data on soil properties to help explain uh, plant community patterns, especially soil nitrogen and carbon, and uh, water infiltration, uh, conduct water infiltration studies at the site, because the sand content didn't show up at all, and uh, we, we would like to actually go in and test that ourselves. Um, we'd also like to perform similar surveys in restore and restore thorn forest. Um, in the lower Rio Grande Valley, especially farther west, to further understand how environmental factors influence restoration outcomes. And with that, I will turn it over to Audrey. So Gerald surveyed the, the vegetation and I surveyed the animals. And we surveyed four different taxa. We surveyed birds, Lepidoptera, uh, mammals, and herps. So for our avian surveys, we did point count surveys. Um, as opposed to a transect when you're walking and surveying with a point count, you just stand in one place for a designated period of time and count uh, as, as many birds as you hear or see. Um, so we did that twice at each of our points and each of them were 10 minutes. And uh, so that's 72 point count surveys in all. And we did them in May and June during breeding season so that they'd be calling more. And we made sure to do it early because that's when the birds are calling. And if it was raining or too windy, we didn't do it. Um, for identification help, uh, I always had a recorder going in case there was something that I just didn't know so I could go back and listen to it again. And I was also using a bird net, which is like Merlin, um, just in the moment if I didn't know something. For our mammal surveys, we set up game cams, of course. Uh, we set up 36 different cameras and made sure to place them all at about the same height and we tried to place them in like a clearing or at a game trail so we'd have um, a good view and not too many grass pictures but let me tell you i have thousands of grass pictures um i would check them every two to four weeks to make sure the batteries were good and to change the sd card and i would take it home and start going through pictures and finding the pictures of animals and sorting them and then we used a uh, a program called Camera Suite to, to analyze the, the photos for us. For butterflies, this was really fun. Uh, we set up traps, 24-hour bait traps, uh, which we baited with rotting bananas. I had a, a crate of rotting bananas in my backyard all summer, which I think my neighbors really appreciated. And um, so we'd go out and set them up in the morning and then come back the next morning and take everything out one by one to see what we have. And, they're all still alive in there. They have food, they have, um, and, and it's a short amount of time. So uh, the first time we did it, though, we used kind of a homemade trap. We had, um, we had 36 of these, and I made them at home. And I remember we'd go out, and we'd have like five moths or butterflies, and we'd get so excited. 
but sometimes we didn't get any. So we started to think maybe this is not an effective trap. So the second time that we did it, we used these fancy traps that we purchased. And I would go out there and I'd have 100 moths and butterflies in 24 hours. So that was kind of a lesson learned, but it was really exciting. Um, we did this once in May and once in July. And then for herps, uh, the first survey method we used were artificial cover objects, which is just a fancy word for anything that you throw on the ground and that uh, herps could take refuge under. And we used, oh, whoops. We used um, pieces of plywood. We put three at each point, so nine per site. So we had 108 boards. And every time we went out to do butterfly traps or to survey birds, we'd check our boards. Um, unfortunately, this was very unsuccessful. Over the course from, from April to August, we only had 14 observations with all of these boards. So about midway through the summer, we were like, we need to add a, an additional survey method. So we did time-constrained area searches, which is just where you search an area at a, set, a steady pace really thoroughly for 15 minutes. Um, we did that twice, and this was much more successful. Just with those two surveys, uh, I think we had about 70 observations. So results from our data collection, that's a picture of Bobcat with her kittens. Um, mammals, we had an average of about 79 trapping days per point, and we observed 18 different mammal species. Uh, three of those were domestic. We had some dogs, some cats, some cows. Uh, we also had humans, um, but the most commonly uh, cited mammal was the raccoon. We had so many raccoon pictures, um, but also white-tailed deer, armadillo, javelina, bobcat, coyote. We also had some ocelot, which was very exciting. Um, that was just at one site at Goat Island, which was our oldest site. Um, and they were aware that they were there. It wasn't like a discovery. <clears throat> uh, for birds, we had 53 different bird species, the most common ones. We most commonly saw all of sparrow. Well, I say saw, but we most commonly heard most of these birds. Um, all of sparrow, morning dove, golden fronted woodpecker, couches kingbird. Um, and you'll notice that these are birds that call. Um, I'm standing in one place, so there's a limited number of birds that you can see, um, but a lot of these birds were calling pretty constantly during breeding season. For herps, uh, we had 83 total observations, 70 via air area search, and 14 with the cover boards, and 10 different species, four lizards, three frogs, two skinks, and one snake, and that one snake I got on the last day of our surveys, I was so happy. Um, but most commonly, we saw brown and ole, four lined skink, and Loretta striped whiptails. And for Lepidoptera, we had over 1,600 observed, 77 different species. 69 of those are moths, and eight of those were beautiful butterflies. So, our analysis results. And as a reminder, now we're looking at how did our site characteristics and our environmental factors influence those numbers that we just saw? Well, our method of restoration was very influential. It influenced each of our taxa in one way or another. It influenced community composition of mammals, leps, and herps. It affected bird richness, lepidopter richness, herptile abundance. But what was interesting is that one method was not showing up as superior to the other. For example, with birds, uh, we had more bird richness in our passively restored sites than our actively restored sites. So our results here weren't as clear cut as they were for vegetation. Um, but this is actually supported by literature. When we look at different studies that have been done, sometimes passive, passively restored sites result in higher richness for certain taxa. It seems to kind of depend maybe on taxa, but maybe even at the species level, it depends. Um, time since restoration was also very influential. No surprise there. It influenced mammals, leps, and the ensemble community, meaning everything put together, uh, lepidopter abundance, and herp richness. And we expected to see diversity increase over time, like we saw with plants, but we didn't see that at all with any of our taxa, actually. Um, degree of isolation also influenced some, uh, some taxa, but not as much as the other two factors. Um, it influenced LEP and herptile community composition. And interestingly, mammal richness increased 
as the site became more isolated. This was an unexpected result, but we speculate that maybe this is the result of kind of a concentration effect. You know, if they're more isolated, maybe they're occurring closer together than they would normally in a larger patch. And then patch size, this is kind of our biggest surprise. It just was not very influential on any of our taxa. Um, it did influence mammal community composition, which kind of makes sense because they're so much larger. Um, but you can find many studies out there that say patch size affects birds and leps and herps, but we just didn't find that. And this might have been due to scale. I think in many studies, they're looking at huge areas and we were looking at smaller areas. Um, but also the effect of patch size might depend on species level preferences of, of home range size. Um, so that was kind of an interesting result. <clears throat> Our other factors that we saw some themes, water was surprise, surprise, very important to animals, um, whether it was distance permanent water, distance to temporary water or moisture in the soil, water was very influential. Invasive grasses were also influential. Um, they negatively affected Lepidoptera and ensemble community composition, ensemble richness, and weekly bird richness. Um, and then ground plant richness and diversity was all very influential on, on Lepidoptera community composition and um, many aspects of mammal communities. So some of the conclusions we can draw from, from this analysis, method of restoration is important. But for animals, the effects might vary by taxa, and one method is not necessarily superior to the other. And time distance restoration is important, but diversity of animals does not necessarily increase with time uh, at this scale. Invasive grasses can have a big impact on restoration. Uh, they reduced the richness of restored animal communities and drove significant differences in community composition. And again, water availability is important, both on the surface and in the soil. And if we were to kind of put together a recommendation from this information for restoration efforts going forward, we would say if actively restoring a site, efforts towards invasive plant control, fostering native plant diversity, and ensuring there's a nearby, nearby water source are likely the most practical steps that can be taken to encourage faunal recolonization. So future directions with this huge data set that we have, um, we'd like to look at individual level uh, species and how they were influenced. We wanna look at some exotic versus na native species and their patterns. And we also wanna look at the effects of border wall, because as you saw, some of our sites were along the border wall and some of them weren't. So we could possibly look at our data and say, did the border wall have a significant effect on our animal communities? And that's it. Any questions for myself or Gerald? Uh, yeah, um, what we did is we, oh yes, um, he's asking about our metric for degree of isolation. Um, so at our site, we just, like using um, Google Earth, we drew a one kilometer radius around it and we um, measured how much thorn scrub was in that radius, um, not counting the patch itself. And we put, we subtracted that from the total, and then we put that over the total. So basically we're looking at the ratio of not thorn scrub in the radius to the total area. And that's, so basically the higher the percentage, the more isolated it was. Yeah. There are lots of different ways to do that in the literature and that just worked best for us. <laughs> that's a great question. That is something that we wanna look into with our data. Um, Oh, the question was, um, how did, how did, um, how does our data contribute to kind of the information about the effects of the border wall, right? Um, I can, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but we want to look into it. Do, do you have anything on that, Gerald? Yeah, we, mm -hmm. so different, because of all the clearing associated with that, we were kind of concerned that there may be um, differences in erosion as well as like, hydrology differences uh, in the areas, um, but also uh, it could become a barrier for uh, different uh, animal and animals, which are seed dispersers or pollinators, because um, one example of, of a barrier for, the, the, I, I forget what country this is, but they found that 
a, an electrical line acts as a barrier for a certain species of bird, which is crazy, right? So I can, like you're saying, 150 feet on either side, I mean, that could definitely influence some movement between those different patches for sure. Um, so those are just, you know, things that we would like to take a look at and find out if those, if the border wall construction and, and the land clearing is affecting that. So I actually had an, another portion of my thesis research was actually focused on invasive grass control. And I, uh, I was actually trying to use cover crops as a way to, to uh, reduce invasive grasses in the restoration context. Unfortunately, we didn't get the cover that we had hoped for with our cover crops. Uh, but from what we did see, we could maybe uh, like think of other vegetation that could maybe outcompete some some of the guinea grass, like maybe a native vetch or a clover or something like that. Um, but again, that's just theorizing. Uh, that hasn't actually been tested yet um, that based on what we saw in our field experiment when we did that. Um, just because, you know, herbicide has a lot of uh, adverse effects to the environment. In our isolation uh, analysis, we did see that mammals and um, birds were less affected by isolation, maybe just because they're more able to disperse because we were looking at medium to large size mammals. We weren't looking at mice, you know, um, but then herps and butterflies had a lot of trouble dispersing um, and they were more impacted by isolation. So I think that is why we saw kind of expected patterns with plants and then more unexpected patterns with animals. But, you know, well, all of our actively restored sites were planted with seedlings, basically. So the, this, the, it was the same across all of them. Um, yeah, a lot of this was like 30 to 50 year old data. So we didn't always have that information. I would love to dig deeper and see, uh, cause you know, sometimes they would plant 300 per hectare or sometimes they would plant a thousand per hectare. And it would be nice to understand the differences between, between those as well. <laughs> it, the yeah. Triggers How were we the big the problem. It was ticks. That was the big problem. We had. Hundreds of ticks, yeah. That Goat Island site, which was the oldest site, we nicknamed that place Tick Island tick because island. I'm yeah. not kidding you. When I placed that white PVC quadrat on the ground to look at ground cover, we could see them crawling over it. Mm -hmm. It was bad there, yeah, real bad. <laughs> Beautiful site, though. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was great. Saw a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.